Today we're going to revisit the Basel problem. That is the value of the sum of the reciprocal of the squares. So this is like a very famous problem and in fact it has lots of different approaches and I've made videos on a couple of the different approaches on the channel before. But today I'd like to look at an approach that speaks towards some of the underlying geometry of this problem. And well, I filled in a lot of details, but this is adapted at least from an article that I found in Math Magazine from 2014. Okay, so how are we going to start here? Well, we're going to start simply with this sum of the reciprocal of the squares. And what I'll do is I'll split this into pieces. So I'm going to write this as 4 thirds times the sum of the reciprocal of the squares. And then, well, of course, if I've got 4 thirds and I want a whole sum of the reciprocal of the squares, that means I need to subtract a third. Simply because, well, 4 thirds minus 1 third is 1. So that may seem pretty silly, but we're going to use this to do, well, the following. We're going to split this first term, this 4 thirds of the reciprocal or the sum of the reciprocal of the squares into odd parts and even parts. So that's going to give us 4 over 3 and then the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity of 1 over 2n plus 1 squared. So those are the odd parts and then plus 4 over 3 times the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over 2n quantity squared. That's the even part. And then of course here we need minus 1 third times the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared. Okay, so just let's note that this is this first term right here spreading out. But now I can do some simplification here. Observe that here I have a 2n quantity squared. If I square the 2, I pick up a 4. But look, I've got a 4 up here in the numerator. That means this 2 here will square and cancel this 4 up here. But then after I've done that, I've got a third of the sum of the reciprocal of the squares minus a third of the sum of the reciprocal of the squares. So of course, that's going to simply cancel. So these things are gone. And then we're left with 4 thirds and the sum of the reciprocal of the odd squares. Okay, and then, well, what are we going to do from here? Well, now we're going to do something which seems maybe a little bit unreasonable, but we'll see how it'll be helpful. I'm going to multiply this by negative 2 over negative 2. So I'll put a negative 2 down here, and then I'll put my other negative 2 inside of the sum. So here I have the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity of minus 2 over, let's see what we have, 2n plus 1 quantity squared. Okay, and now let's do a little bit of simplification. So let's observe that this 4 thirds and this 1 over negative 2 will cancel down to a minus 2. 2 thirds. And then I'm going to do something weird with this sum right here. I'm going to make it look like we're adding the even terms back in, but as we'll see, the way that we do this, the even terms will be connected to a coefficient of 0. So I'm going to write this as the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity, and then I'll put an n squared in the denominator, and then in the numerator I'm going to put minus 1 to the n minus 1. So now, well, let's see why this works. So this is simply equal to 0 when n is even, and it's equal to minus 2 over n squared when n is odd. So of course, that's going to collapse everything down just to exactly this sum that I have right above. Okay, so that's actually a pretty important step. Now, next up what I'll do is I'll rewrite this minus 1 to the n in a pretty special form. Okay, so let's get to that. We have minus 2 over 3, and then we have our sum as n goes from 1 to infinity 
of e to the i n times pi minus 1 over n squared. And then, well, why does this work? Well, this is because of the following fact. So we have e to the i n times pi is, of course, equal to the cosine of n times pi plus i times the sine of n times pi. But then, well, the sine of any integer times pi is equal to zero. So this term right here simply goes to zero. And then, well, the cosine of even numbers times pi is equal to positive one, whereas the cosine of odd numbers times pi is equal to negative one. And that's, you know, we can check a couple of the simple values just to convince ourselves of that. So cosine of zero is one, cosine of two pi is one, cosine of four pi is one, cosine of pi is negative one, cosine of three pi is negative one. Well, I mean, all of this boils down to the fact that cosine is two pi periodic. Well, anyway, that's gonna be the same thing as having minus one to the n here. Okay, so that's pretty cool. And then, well, the next thing that we're gonna do is, well, let's maybe do it in this step. We'll take this number one right here. I'm gonna write it as e to the i n times the number zero, because e to the zero is of course equal to one. And then, well, maybe one more step right here before we do something else. I'm going to multiply this by an i in the numerator and an i in the denominator. Of course, that is just like multiplying by the number 1. And now, well, let's observe that this term right here, this e to the i n pi minus e to the i n 0, it looks like something that I sometimes call a zeroth integral. In other words, evaluation at endpoints. And that's exactly how we want to write this. So this is going to be equal to minus 2i over 3. And then we'll have the sum as n goes from 1 up to infinity of, I'm going to write this as e to the i n theta over i n squared evaluated from theta equals 0 up to theta equals pi. And then I'm going to do one more thing as well. I'm going to multiply this by minus 1 to the n plus 1. And that might seem like, oh, I'm making this thing alternating now. But let's notice that, well, this object right here, this e to the i n theta evaluated from 0 to pi, it's only non-zero when n is odd. So that means all of the places where this entire term is non-zero, our minus one to the n plus one is equal to a positive one. So I actually didn't change anything by introducing that thing that seems to be alternating. Okay, but next up what I'm gonna do is change a zeroth integral, in other words, evaluation, to a first integral by taking the derivative. In other words, we're using the fundamental theorem of calculus here. So let's do that. So taking the derivative, it's gonna be with respect to theta, obviously, because our evaluation is with respect to theta. We have now the sum as n goes from one up to infinity. We have this minus one to the n plus one. And now we'll have the integral from zero up to pi of what? Well, taking the derivative of this with respect to theta, we'll get, bring an i times n down. That'll cancel this i and one of these n's, leaving us with e, to the i n theta over n. And then here we have a d theta. Okay, so I think that's looking pretty good. And now, well, we're gonna do this one more time. Well, this evaluation trick. And this one's gonna be as follows. Let's write this as minus two i over three. So that's just coming down. And then I'm gonna bring this integral outside. So maybe post in the comments of why we can do that. And then we'll have our sum as n goes from 1 up to infinity of, now this is going to be equal to minus 1 to the n. I'm actually going to write that as minus 1 to the n minus 1. Because observe that n plus 1 and n minus 1 have the same parity. So that doesn't change anything. And then I'm going to write this as z to the n over n evaluated from z equals 0 up to z equals e to the i 
theta. And then of course, this is all within our d theta integral. Okay, so let's maybe bring this object over here and we'll keep going. Okay, so here's where we left ourselves off. Our sum of reciprocal of squares was equal to negative two i over three, and then we have the integral from zero to pi of the sum as n goes from one to infinity of minus one to the n minus one times z to the n all over n, where that z is being evaluated from zero up to e to the i theta, well, and then d theta because this is all within an integral. But now, again, we wanna think about our evaluation as a zeroth integral. We can transform that to a first integral by taking the derivative, in this case, with respect to z. So let's see what that'll leave us with. So now we'll have minus two i over three. We've got our integral from zero to pi. Then we've got our integral from zero to e to the i theta. And then, well, taking this derivative, well, actually, I've got my sum now. So I've got my, so I've got my sum now in one to infinity. Now taking the derivative, well, this n is gonna come down, cancel the n in the denominator, and we'll pick up a z to the n minus one. But I'm gonna combine that with this minus one to the n minus one to give me minus z to the n minus one and then I'll have dz d theta. Okay, great. But now this stuff that I'm underlining in yellow, observe that that is simply a geometric series where my starting term is the number one because that corresponds to n equals one, which would be minus z to the zero. And my common ratio is minus z. So I've got a nice formula for geometric series. So let's insert that here we have minus two i over three, integral zero to pi, integral zero to e to the i theta, of one over one minus the common ratio, which turns into one over one plus z dz d theta. Okay, great. But now, well, taking this inner integral is fairly straightforward. We know that should be the log of one plus z. So let's write that down. We have our minus two i over three, and then integral zero to pi, and then the log of one plus z. I'm writing this as the log instead of the natural log because generally when we're working with complex numbers or complex variables, which we are here because z takes on complex va values, we write log, and then we split that into two parts as we'll see. Okay, so we've got log of z evaluated from z equals zero to z equals e to the i theta d theta. Now, if you plug in z equals zero, get the log of one, which is zero. So all we really need to worry about is plugging in the z equals e to the i theta. So let's do that. We have minus two i over three, integral zero to pi of log of one plus e to the i theta d theta. So now we've got this object to worry about. Now I'm gonna recall something over here in the margin, and that is, well, what's going on with the complex logarithm? So let's recall that the log of a complex variable z is equal to the natural log of the modulus of z and then plus i times the argument of z. Where let's recall that the modulus of z is the distance that z is from the origin and the argument, well, that's the angle made from the ray going from the origin to z with the positive real axis. Okay, so let's write that down. So this is minus two i by three of our integral from zero to pi of, well, now we're gonna have the natural log of the modulus of one plus e to the i theta d theta. And then we'll have another minus two i by three integral zero to pi of the argument of one plus e to the i theta d theta. And I realized I 
left out my i there, but that's no worry. I'll multiply it in with this i, which gives us minus one, which flips that minus to a plus. But now I'm gonna do a little bit of a internal calculation. We're not gonna work out all of the details to this. Um, you can check out the details. I think I did some logarithmic trigonometric integrals on the channel before. So this modulus of one plus e to the i theta is in fact equal to two times the cosine of theta over two. And then if you integrate that from zero to pi, you end up with the number zero. So again, I'm not gonna work out all the details for that just to keep this a little bit shorter. So that means this entire first term just goes to zero. So that means what we have here is two thirds and then the integral from zero to pi of the argument of one plus e to the i theta d theta. Okay, so let's see what that is. Okay, so here's where we ended up. Our sum of reciprocal of squares was equal to two thirds, the integral from zero to pi of the argument of one plus e to the i theta d theta. So now let's see if we can work this out. And this is where the geometry comes in. So I'd like to point out that the graph z equals one plus e to the i theta, where theta goes from zero to pi is equal to the top half of a circle where the radius is equal to one and the center is the point uh, z equals one. In other words, it's the coordinate zero one. Okay, so let's get a picture of that on the board. All right, there we've got a picture of the situation on the board. So observe that we've got this top half of the circle one plus e to the i theta where the center is one and the radius is one. And this works out because at theta equals zero, we get one plus e to the zero. In other words, we get the number two. And then, well, when theta is pi, e to the i pi is famously negative one, and we get one plus negative one, which is zero. Furthermore, you can check like other pieces as well. If theta is equal to, let's see, pi over two, e to the i pi over two is equal to one, and you get this point up here, which is the point one, one. And so generally, we've got a point over there, e to the i theta plus one. And well, where in this picture is the angle theta? Well, it's right here, of course, just because of how this thing is parametrized. Just think about this as the unit circle that's been shifted over by one. Well, we're adding one, the real number one to it. And now we're gonna use a famous theorem called Euclid's inscribed angle theorem to pick up this angle right here. So in fact, this angle right here by that theorem is equal to theta over two. And well, you may seem like, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, but this is also exactly equal to the argument of one plus e to the i theta by the definition of the argument. It's the angle that's made but with the positive x-axis, which is exactly what we have here. Okay, well, that's actually enough to finish everything off. Now we can go over here to our integral and replace that argument with theta over two. Let's maybe bring the two out front and we'll have one third because that's gonna cancel the two in the numerator. The integral from zero up to pi of theta d theta. Now taking the antiderivative, we'll have one over six times theta squared evaluated from zero to pi because we pick up an extra two. Evaluating that at zero, we get zero. At pi, we get pi squared. And so we get pi squared over six, which is famously the value of the sum of the reciprocal of the squares. And well, notice we got a nice geometric picture, you know, behind the whole thing. And that's a good place to stop.